and welcome back to another video of JPlay. I am Marcus and today I want to play a couple of rounds of Merlin which has been designed by one of my most favorite game designers of all time, Stefan Feld and this one here has been co-designed by Michael Rienig. I'm not quite sure if I want to do a full playthrough today but I will definitely start and then yeah, let's see how things go. Okay, I've already prepared the game board for a three-player game. The starting positions for the players will be determined by those so-called startup cards. So for example, I think this was the card for the blue player. He starts here in the orange principality. He gets one of those purple snake shields. He gets a blue resource and he's allowed to place one influence cube down there here in this gray principality. Most of the stuff will also be reflected on the so-called castle board for each of the players. So here is the purple shield, here is the blue resource. Each of the blue players starts with one of those apples, three of those Merlin staffs. I already rolled all four dice for those cards. Those are the four, I think it was mission cards or order cards or something like that. And at random I also assigned three traitors for each of the players. The red player, today played by Wins Clauter here, was kind of unlucky. It's This can be good, so don't get me wrong. So he got two of those purple traitors during setup and one of those black traitors here. He starts the game with one purple cube and he was able to place one of his influence cubes there in the blue principality. But I think I will explain all this all those bits and pieces as I go. And last but not least, here we have the yellow player played by Sewell, the gatekeeper here. He also got three random traitors at the start. He was kind of lucky because he started the game with one shield that more or less matches to one of those traitors. So he will be able to defend this traitor at the end of round two right away. He starts the game with a gray building resources. Those are his starting dice. Again, I rolled those. One thing to note, if you would roll a three of a kind in those four rolls, you would re-roll all of those. But in this case, that's perfectly legal. And he starts the game with one influence here in this Black Principality. This is also the location where the Merlin figure will start always here, this Black Dragon. I don't know, seat here or entrance to this principality. And I also already prepared the realm here, the environs, I think this is referred to. Keep in mind, I'm playing with the Queenie 1 mini expansion, so some of the tiles will not be available in the base game. Pretty much from the base game are only those tower tiles here. All those other realm tiles or environment tiles are from the Queenie 1, which I think really adds a lot to, yeah, let's say, how this environs up there works. Apart from that, the base game is perfectly fine. I'm not playing with the extra module here. I think this is called the King's Favor or so, because this game is already pretty tough when playing this on your own or thinking for your own. Playing this for three players, I think this can be really too much for me. And this one adds a whole new dimension to the way how you have to think your yeah, turns through in this game. So I think we should be good to go and bear with me. This is a really complex game. Again, I mentioned this already earlier. Playing this on your own is already pretty challenging. Playing this for three players uh, is basically next to impossible, at least for me. So expect me to do some very stupid decisions and maybe the one or two yeah, occasional little goofs I tend to do. Merlin is played over six rounds at the end of round two, four and six. There's an intermediate scoring round where you can really achieve a lot of victory points. And then at the end of the game, you will still score some other stuff you will have in your realm, like those Merlin staffs you haven't spent or those apples which you haven't spent. And also resources or components which you haven't used are also worth some victory points by the end of the game. But this is really not not worth mentioning compared to what you can achieve throughout the game. Each player starts the game with four of those mission cards and to be honest you always have four of those mission cards in hand so normally you are allowed to play one of these mission cards during your turn and once you play this card at the end of your turn you would be allowed to redraw up to four cards anyway. There are some exceptions where you can play also two of those mission cards during a turn but I hope I will come to that in a second. 
Blue is the starting player shown by this nice little starting player crown here. Now it's time to make use out of your dice. Those blue dice are for your knight figure that's on the board on the round table here. And the white dice represents the movement for Merlin. Your knight is only allowed to move in a clockwise direction. Whereas Merlin is allowed to move forwards and backwards. Of course, you always have to move the full distance that's shown on this dice, unless you sacrifice one of your apples, which allows you to set one die of your choice to any side you want. That's definitely something you have seen in other felt games as well. So sometimes you can set it, sometimes you add plus one or plus two, but in this case, you can really freely set any side of the die. But I think Blue wants to move his knight first. So he's spending his die with a number three, which allows him to move his blue knight one, two, three spaces ahead. Right now, I think I don't need to spend my apple. I think this action here is fine. And this action pretty much allows you to take one shield out of a principality where you have at least one of your influence cubes. At the start of the game, you only have one influence yeah, stone here in one of the principalities. In the case of the blue player that's here in the gray realm or principality, here and this allows him now to take one of those shield tokens with this nice peaceful dove here which you place on the castle board in the appropriate slot here. This shield now allows the blue player to defend this traitor at the end of the scoring or the start of the scoring round after round two. So normally you would get minus three victory points if you would not be able to defend this traitor here but in this case we are doing pretty fine so we just found our very first shield. Nice job. Normally I would now have been able to also play one of those mission cards but unfortunately I was not able to and I'm really aiming to fulfill this mission card here which tells me I have to have a blue resource and a brown resource. Right now I already have a blue resource which isn't that bad and I'm not too far from the brown principality where I could also gain my brown cube. So I think during my next turn I should be able to fulfill this mission. Okay, then it's Wins, the red player, who is not really pleased with his result, but normally there's always something that you can do with your results. And this is very typical for a Stefan Feld game, even though it looks a little bit luck dependent, but normally there's always something meaningful you can do. So he will start with moving Merlin. Keep in mind, he can also move Merlin counterclockwise and he will move Merlin back to the build action here and now this allows him to build one mana and as he starts the game with a purple cube he can now build a mana in this line in this line or in this line here and I'm really thinking of building a mana onto this tower here I think this is really making sense for him right now he has the majority in this region here so if that would be the end result after round two, this would score him five victory points, which is insane. But yeah, definitely counter that, that the other players will also go there sooner or later. But now as he plays his mana on this tower tile, he also gets the bonus that's printed here. So he can place another influence marker. He can take a flag or he can take a shield from any of the principalities. And I think in this case, he wants to take the flag from the black principality which he will place next to his castle board and this flag allows you to remove a whole stack of traitors so in this case he could get rid of both of those traitors during the final or during the scoring round after round two so that's really really valuable for him but of course this was also pretty great that he was able to build this manor in this huge region here Okay, then it's the yellow player. And I think yellow wants to move one, two spaces here using his number two dice. This space allows you to exchange up to two of your mission cards with two mission cards, either from the offering, which is up here, or from the draw pile directly. Of course, you can also do that in any combination. And I think he wants to do that. Overall, the, he was also not very satisfied with his role, but again, there's definitely something that he can do with those cards and I think he wants to take those two cards here and therefore he wants to discard two different cards which simply go to the discard pile here. 
course we will draw up okay and by the way this is the amount of victory points you get when you achieve this mission then it's the blue player again he will place his blue die here in order to move his knight there can be as many figures on any space as basically possible yeah we are all friends here and this allows you to place one of your henchmen onto the appropriate spot on the principality if the henchman is already out there on the board you can relocate him and in this case he wants to place his builder and the builder allows you to take one yeah stone out of that principality you see also this little cube symbol here on the builder normally you really start thinking hey how should you know what you do with all of those henchmen here but normally there's always a little symbol or iconography it's pretty clear what you can do with those henchmen this stone or building material goes right onto your castle board and now i have a blue and a brown stone which means i can now fulfill my mission so we play it right away and therefore we scored our very first two victory points and then we can draw an additional card and i think i want to take this card here so let's refill that okay oh, interesting stuff but this is already the end of the blue player's turn Okay, then it's red again. He will use his red five die here. One, two, three, four, and five. And this space allows you to place one of your henchmen figure into a principality where you have at least one influence. And in this case, he wants to place the shield bearer into the blue principality, which allows him to take one of those shield tokens. So let's place it accordingly. Right now, he cannot really use it, but Believe me, I have a plan for the red player. Then it's yellow. Yellow wants to move his yellow knight again. Two spaces, one, two, into the orange principality. This nice looking fox here. And I think he wants to play his lady there. And the lady allows you to place one of your influence cube in that principality. An influence cube, as you already have seen, is a great way to give you more options when you know, choosing stuff around the round table here. But they also provide you some victory point during each scoring round back to blue and i think blue wants to move merlin again he can do that counterclockwise but one two three four and five doesn't provide him anything meaningful so one two three four and five and this pretty much gives you one victory point for each shield you currently have and right now the blue player has exactly two shields which means he just got two more of those victory points in theory blue could have spent one of those merlin staffs in order to do the action of merlin again but unfortunately those staffs are also worth two victory points by the end of the game and yeah right now he would trade it for two victory points so i think right now this doesn't really make sense for him then it's red. He wants to move his red knight one space ahead and this space allows you to trade one shield, one stone or one flag worth us. Anything else that's printed on the bottom here you can exactly do that one time and in this case I think he wants to give back the orange shield here in order to take one of those black shields. Here. Keep in mind he still has the flag this allows him to remove basically the whole stack of traitors during the scoring round so he really don't doesn't have to worry about those traitors here too much at this point in time. And then it's yellow and yellow ah, he's really not happy. I think he has to spend his one and only apple this goes back to the reserve in order to transform this five into a four keep in mind he can choose any face of this die and with a four he will move one two three four spaces here to the brown principality there he wants to place his shield bearer and this allows him to take one of those brown shields which he or in this case she that Sewell after all has to play on his castle board here now he has blue and a brown shield which helps him to accomplish this mission here for two points in total not too bad and I think Sewell wants to refill her hand from the draw pile here then it's the last action for blue if i'm not mistaken yeah that's the case he will place his six i think he will not use his apple i was tempted for a second but i think that's also still okay for him one two three four five and 
six and again this allows him to trade any one let's call it resource or component and i think he wants to give away this purple shield in order to take one of those brown shields so at least he would now be able to defend both of those traitors here but he still has to take care about of this uh, blue trade here but there is still one full round in order to accomplish this then it's red he will move one space ahead this gives him one victory point for each shield he has right now he has two shields so he also moves one two spaces here on the score track and last but not least it's yellow he can move Merlin, he will move him backward. One, two, three, four, five spaces in order to build a mana. Yellow started the game with a gray cube here, so he can build in one of those lines here. He would be able to gain Excalibur, which isn't bad at all, but I think he wants to build into this row here in order to gain this tower bonus, which is always a good thing. So yeah, let's do that. So he will place a uh, yellow mana in that region there and for his bonus he will place an influence cube here into the gray principality and now he can score this card here because he has influence in the gray principality as well as in the orange principality so in this case Sewell just scored an additional two victory points not too bad Okay, this was the first full round of Merlin. I think I will do another round now in order to also show you the scoring. So everyone will roll his four dice now. Keep in mind, three of a kind will be re-rolled, but we don't have that case here. Those are the dice for the blue player. I will roll the dice for the other players off camera. We will move the turn track here and the starting player will now move to the next player in line, which is the red player. Okay, starting with a red player, he will use his die with a number six. One, two, three, four, five, and six in order to exchange a component. And I think in this case, he wants to give away this blue shield in order to take a gray stone, which he should be able to use during a later turn or so. Then it's the yellow player, and I think he wants to move a Merlin. Yes, one, two spaces here to the Black Principality. There he will place his Builder in order to take a Black Stone onto his game board. And I think he now also wants to spend his yeah, Merlin stuff in order to do that action again. But this means he has to place an additional Henchman, so he cannot use the Builder here again. And in this case, he wants to use his flag bearer here. This allows him to take this black flag here. Now he has two henchmen in the black principality, which means Zul can score yet another mission card worth two victory points. So she's really doing good. Of course, the Merlin staff was also worth two victory points, but yeah, you will never know. I think Sue wants to take this card in order to replenish her hand. Let's draw a new one. Okay, two henchmen in the blue principality. Okay, then it's the blue player. He will move Merlin two spaces counterclockwise. He is now allowed to build a manor. And I think he doesn't want to leave this huge region to the red player here. So in this case, he wants to spend his blue building material in order to build the blue manor here. Right now, they are tied, so they would pretty much share the price there, round it down, so each of the players would gain two victory points, if that would be the end result after the first scoring phase. But of course, we are still allowed to take the bonus of this tower here, and I think in this case, blue simply wants to take the blue shield. So now he should be able to defend all of those or from all of those traitors. But as blue has two building materials, I think he also wants to spend Merlin stuff here in order to build again. And this time he wants to build with his brown building material. And I think he really wants to dominate this region here. So he will place it here. And this is now one of the mean queenie tiles here because 
every other player now has to give up either a flag or a shield of course all the others but the blue player which is kind of mean he didn't want to do it that way because normally it's better to gain stuff than the other players losing stuff but in this case he really wants to dominate that region so this was his main business case in order to go there so i think red needs to decide first and that was a very very mean move to be honest uh, because here there are he could lose six points here he could only lose three points i think he wants to give away this shield here back to the principality where it came from and i think oh, yellow wants to do the same wow that's really tough for both of the players because we are short before a scoring round and right now in theory he would lose six victory points which is a big deal in this game so i can totally see that some of the players out there don't like this queenie at all especially those tiles here which really hinders the other player rather than benefit yourself Okay, back to Red. He wants to move Merlin one, two, three, four spaces here onto the Excalibur space, which means he is now allowed to take Excalibur. And Excalibur allows you to immediately remove one of the traitors from your castle board. In this case, this was really good for him. So he will totally get rid of this black traitor here. We'll simply go back to the discard pile. Then it's yellow. He wants to move his knight with a three. One, two and three. This gives you one victory point for each stone or building material you have. Right now yellow has exactly one stone, which means she just scored an additional victory point. Back to blue. He places his six. One, two, three, four, five and six bases here. In the blue principality, he will place his flag bearer here in order to gain this flag. And this flag is pretty cool. All of those flags are pretty cool. Those are one time effects which you can use. And this allows you to move your knight counterclockwise, which can be a huge deal at, a, at any point in the game. So let's place the flag here. And by the way, I really love how all those components go together at these night boats. How those traitors are placed here. The flags have their own position, the shields. Really, I love the whole style of this game. Then it's red. He will move his knight one, two, three, four spaces here. This space gives you one stone out of a principality where you have at least one influence. In this case, he only has one influence in the blue principality. So he's allowed to gain a blue stone. And because Sul lost one of her shields, I think she wants to place this die here in order to move her knight one space there. She will now relocate her shield bearer oops, uh, to the black principality. And now I'm really messing all things up here. And in order, yeah, right, to give the, uh, take this black shield because right now she would lose at least six points if she would not do anything against it. She can still use her flag. This is still a stack, but yeah, normally you want to keep this flag in order to wait when you have at least two of those traitors on the same principality. But yeah, right now she may still consider spending that flag during the scoring round. Blue is next. He wants to move his knight one, two, three spaces here. This allows you to move one of your henchmen one region to the next or previous principality. And I think in this case, he wants to move his she, uh, flag bearer from the blue principality to the purple principality in order to take this flag here. This flag allows you to place the, any die to the opposite face, to be honest, so from two to a five, for example. And because he has now the purple and the blue flag, he will be allowed to accomplish this mission here worth additional two victory points. The last die for red, which is a two, one, two spaces here, which allows him to build an additional mana, which is really, really great. And he really doesn't want to leave this region with a blue player here. So he will spend his blue cube in order to build the red manor into this region here. This gives him an apple and an additional victory point, which isn't a bad thing. 
Last dive for the yellow player as well. That's a six. One, two, three, four, five, and six. This allows you to get the Holy Grail. And the Holy Grail always comes with an apple who <laughs> has thought about this. And this Holy Grail also can help you as kind of a tiebreaker doing the scoring role. But I think I should be able to demonstrate that to you in a second. Then it's also the last dive for the blue player. That's a two, one, two spaces here. I think he doesn't want to spend an apple. He will simply get one building material of a principality where he has at least one influence right now. That's only gray at this point in time. Right now, only yellow is doing really great in respect to those influences here. So Sul has way more options when it comes to those spaces here, but with building material you can never go wrong. Okay, those were all the actions before we now wrap up for or in order to prepare round three, we will now conduct a scoring round. The first thing that you always do is to check if you were able to defend all of your traitors. Yes, in this case, blue player was. So all those shields will be removed, the traitors here as well. So you always have to basically prepare yourself um, from round to round or from each two rounds to be honest. Red player will now spend his black flag here in order to get rid of this deck here and as he's now holding Excalibur and he was able to defend all traitors at his castle board he scores three victory points which is really really huge. You should never underestimate Excalibur or the Holy Grail. Last but not least, we have to check with Zul. Unfortunately, she was not able to defend from all of those. So she will definitely spend her flag in order to, I don't know, get rid of this def uh, traitor here. This guy was fended off, which is a good thing, but unfortunately she was not able to basically protect the white or gray principality here. And therefore she will lose one, two, three victory points. Keep in mind that this doesn't really happen that often. In this case, this really only happened because blue placed his mana onto this tile. And also keep in mind that this is a tile from the Queenie expansion. Though if you don't like this, you don't have to play with it because it's part of an add-on. After scoring, we will reveal three new traitors here, drawn randomly again. That's a purple one, an orange one, and a brown one here for the blue play. I will do the other players off camera. Next we score the regions. Right now only the yellow player is alone. So yellow would score two points for this region here. She has the majority in this region of manners and the, this environment of this region is worth two victory points because one, two regions here, one, two tiles there. Therefore she simply scores one, two victory points. Then it's this huge region here. Right now, those guys are tight. This region is worth one, two, three, four, five victory points. So both red and the blue player score two points each. Not really a bad thing. And last but not least, we score the influence in each of the principalities. Right now, we have one influence cube here. So this principality is worth one victory point and yellow has the majority. So in this case, Sewell just scored an additional victory point. The same is true here. She's alone. This principality is worth one victory point. This principality down there is worth two victory points because there are two influence cubes here. And right now they are tight, so they would both get two victory points, but not so fast as Sewell was able to gain the Holy Grail. She will now place the Holy Grail here in order to break the tie in her favor. So she just scores those two victory points alone, which is definitely great for her so she's back in the lead and last but not least we have the red player who is all on his own here in the blue principality and therefore he also scores one victory point and then it's last but not least because you still score your henchmen who are out on the board all of the players have four henchmen blue has two henchmen on the board which means therefore he just scored two more points red only has one henchman out on the board which is really bad so he only gets one victory point and believe it or not Sue was sending out henchmen like crazy though so sh therefore she just scored oops one two three four more victory point 
wow that's really great for her and that's pretty much the end of round two so next we would prepare for round three so everyone would roll the dice we would move the starting player token over to the yellow player but i think i will call it a day for now so if you're interested in to see one more episode so basically two more rounds of this playthrough just send in your comment vote it up or whatnot and i would definitely consider doing one maybe if the excitement is out there and everyone wants to see it then i will also consider playing it to the bitter end so overall it's a relatively fast paced game but really the thinking in between turns can really take a lot of time so you really always have to consider hey should i first move my two and then the three the first of the one and then the three when should i use my apple when should i use all the other cool flags that are out there so there's really a lot of thinking going on between the turns and i spared you my thinking time by the magic of video editing in this point in time but still overall the actions per se really play play relatively fast so I really hope you enjoyed my little, yeah, call it playthrough, walkthrough of Merlin here. And yes, you see it right. I was able to get a signature from both Stefan Feld and Mike Renex. Really appreciate it, guys. And yeah, hope to see you soon in one of my other videos. And until then, bye-bye. <laughs>